Hello, good morning and welcome to Safety Ridge on Sunday. Happy Coronation Weekend and what an event it was yesterday. And the party, of course, continues today. You might have noticed, though, we're still in Westminster for the show this week rather than our Sky News Coronation studio. And that is because despite the celebrations and the ceremony, there's an awful lot of fallout still from those local elections. And if you feel that the pause in coverage of those extraordinary results left you wanting more analysis, you're in the right place. We will still be reflecting on the coronation, of course, and in particular, whether the police were heavy handed in dealing with protesters. On the show this morning, our top guest, given the council results pointing to Labour forming the next government, is the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. We'll also be discussing the results with the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, and plenty to talk about when we sit down with the Lib Dem Deputy Leader, Daisy Cooper. Plus, to talk a bit more about how the Conservatives can improve their chances at the next election, we'll speak to the Conservative MP for Thurrock in Essex, Jackie Dorpice. Good morning. Now, the local elections marked a milestone moment for Labour. They're now the largest party of local government, overtaking the Conservatives for the first time since 2002. And if the results were replicated in a general election, it would be Keir Starmer in number 10, even if it wasn't quite enough for an overall majority. Well, earlier I spoke to the Shadow House Secretary, Wes Streeting. Uh, great to have you on the programme this morning. So you were at the coronation yesterday. Any particular highlights? I mean, the whole thing, it was a, a, an amazing event. And I thought, especially against the backdrop of things not working in our country across the board, great to see so many things that make our country great on display, whether it was the music, the spectacle, the military processions, the fly pass, the celebrations of people coming right together across the, the, the country. Uh, it was just an, an amazing moment to be there. And also really nice talking to people in the Abbey who had been chosen to attend because of their voluntary service, their community service, their public service, which I thought actually spoke to, directly to what Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was saying about the theme of the coronation, you know, around service to others, looking out for other people. Uh, so really wonderful occasion and obviously a massive privilege to be there. Are you a bit of a royalist then? I am. I, I, I think our constitutional monarchy has served us really well. Um, and I think that, you know, 300 million people, I think it was, watching right across the world um, is a good thing for our country, actually. And, you know, just reflecting back on some of the royal visits we've had in, in my borough over the years, anyone who met um, the late Queen, anyone who's met senior members of the royal family, it's a really special moment, actually, and a way to, um, I think, recognise and and celebrate people in a way that wouldn't quite be the same um, if we'd had a different system. You mentioned the late Queen there, who obviously people felt such affection for and, um, you know, an, an honour towards. What kind of king do you think Charles will be? I think he'll be a good king. Uh, I think we know that he cares about a range of causes, but of course now he's the king and um, puts some of that to one side, but I think... Do so you think he should head put of, some of that to a, one side then? Well, well of course, he, he has to, but as, as a head of state, uh, it's, it's the responsibility of the king or the queen to bring people together. And I think there are ways in which the royal family, on issues of consensus and, important, and issues of important national significance or international significance, can bring people together, whether that's on issues like tackling climate change or actually the role of the monarchy as part of Britain's soft power, their diplomatic pulling power. There are lots of ways in which the royal family add enormous value to our country collectively, let alone those special moments of the garden parties and the royal visits. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about the policing of what happened, because there have been a number of arrests of people protesting the coronation. Now, the Met released a statement. They said, we understand public concern following arrests made this morning. We police proportionately, and in the context of the event, it's a once-in-a-generation moment that's been a key consideration. Do you think the police response has been proportionate? Well, firstly, I'm glad that the police are providing context and recognise the accountability that comes with policing. I think Mark Rowley, the Metropolitan Com Police Commissioner, knows that there's a lot of work to do to rebuild trust with the Met in particular. So that transparency and that accountability is important. Uh, I think it's also important to recognise that in Trafalgar Square, for example, there was a significant Republican protest that took place peacefully, mm -hmm. uh, without incident, 
Um, you know, as you said, I'm someone who supports the monarchy, but I respect people who have a different view and I respect their right to protest. And I think the police does too. There are, of course, some cases that are being raised, probably not important. I don't comment on specific cases while there are potentially still investigations or action ongoing, but that accountability piece is going to be really important um, to make sure that the policing was proportionate and to make sure that where people have concerns that they're I addressed. I understand, you know, you don't want to talk too much about specifics, but I do want to talk about some of the specifics because I think it is quite important to give the overall picture. You know, because, for example, three people reportedly arrested volunteers with the Night Stars programme. So that's, you know, Westminster Council's street safety pro programme handing out rape alarms. I mean, this kind of thing is quite worrying. As you say, there is concern about policing by consent as it is. Yeah, and, and, and it's that principle that's important, policing by consent. I know Westminster City Council has put out a statement expressing concern mm -hmm. and asking for that to be looked into. I think that's an important thing to do. And if the police have been disproportionate or got things wrong, it's important, as we've seen with the Casey Review, that they hold their hands up and acknowledge it. I'd also just acknowledge that days like yesterday are really difficult for the police. It's an enormous security operation. Uh, there were concerns, I know, so in regard... they got it right, then? That's what I'm trying well, to get. I, I mean, look, the, the truth is, Sophie, um, you know, I, I didn't... wasn't there, didn't see, not across mm. the details of specific cases yet. Um, and so I don't think it's appropriate for me to provide a running commentary without all of the facts. I think it's the accountability that's important and where concerns have been raised, whether that's, um, you know, by Republic, um, you know, the, the, the campaign yeah. for um, a, a, an elected head of state, um, or, or people more generally just concerned about what they've read in the papers or seen on the telly. So it's in, important that the police provide that accountability. In, in principle, then, anti-monarchy protesters, are they... In your eyes, is it reasonable for them to go along, peacefully protest, but noisily protest, for example? Yeah, look, um, if, if, if you're a Republican, of course you're going to protest around the coronation. If you're not going to do it around the coronation, when would you? And I don't agree with them, but I absolutely respect their right to protest. And actually, in terms of things that make me proud of our country and our democracy, I think it's the fact that you can have those two events taking place simultaneously, the spectacle in the Abbey, thousands of people packing the mall, the street paths across the country, and have that space for people to express a different view, to protest. That's one of our strengths as a country. And I think there's one reflection I'd just offer as a politician, actually, reflecting on the divisions in our country, many of them political divisions, We've got to learn the art of being able to disagree well in Britain and to hold different views, strongly hold them, robustly debate them, but to do so in a way that's respectful. And, and you know, I don't agree with the Republican protesters out yesterday, but I absolutely respect them. I think their point of view is legitimate and I respect their right to voice their views. Right, let's talk local elections, shall we? You must be pretty yes, pleased please, with the yeah. result. We are very pleased. We're, we're, I mean, we're, the results that we saw right across England, in every corner of England, were encouraging, I mean, important in of, them, of themselves, I should say, for those Labour local government leaders who are now going to be able to do things to deliver for their communities, having one power in places like Plymouth and Medway, uh, as well as um, in the north of England as well, uh, you know, gains right across the, uh, the country. Uh, I think for the next general election, uh, Labour feels confident but not complacent. And I want to make sure that both of those things are heard because, yes, I think those results do point to enormous progress made under Keir Starmer's leadership. He's changed the Labour Party. Now he's got a hearing to be able to change oh, yeah. the country, but there's more to do. Now, Labour has said that the results show that you're on course for a majority at the next election. And I'll be honest, I don't understand how you've got there, OK? So what the experts are saying is, yes, it's great, but you wouldn't get a majority. And if, I have, if we look now, I think we can have a look at, at the House of Commons projection uh, from Rawlings and Thrasher. So these are the experts. And I know you're going to say, look, you can't read across from local elections to general elections. But according to this, you wouldn't be on course for a majority, would you? And this is because, you know, you're starting from such a bad place, frankly, at the last election, that you need such an enormous swing to get there. And these results don't put you on course for a majority. Well, you're, you're right, Sophie. I am going to say that yeah. these are... You can't read across, but it is important to say that this is, this is not um, a prediction for the next general election. This is what would have happened if the local elections had been a general election, and they weren't for a number of reasons. OK, I mean... let, me, let me show you another graph, then, in that case. I want to show you these are the council seat uh, graph uh, going back in time historically, and I think we can bring that one up, um, because I, I understand the concerns about the uh, majority projections, the House of Commons projection, but let's have a look at this. This is council seats going back through time. And because you're starting from such a bad place, you would 
need an even bigger uh, national swing from the Conservatives than in the 1997 landslide. Um, and if you analyse the local elections, you're around nine to ten points ahead. But at this point before the 1997 election, Tony Blair was about 14 points ahead in 1996. So you wouldn't get there, would you? It's, it's not showing that you're on course for a majority. Well, I'd say two things. One is, if you'd told us in 2019 that this is where Labour would be four years following that worst defeat since 1935, I don't think anyone would have said that was possible. But Keir Starmer has changed the Labour Party uh, and earned us a hearing with the voters who turned their backs on Labour. And people are turning to Labour again. That's why I say we're not complacent. We know that there is more work to do to earn people's trust and support. But on the basis of the results we saw on Thursday, we are confident that Labour can win a majority. But in terms of um, our policies for the next general election, in terms of the results that I think we will get at the next general election, the best is yet to come. Would you be prepared to go into a coalition? With the Lib Dems, we're not even entirely that prospect, Sophie. That's because not a direct no, not even, to the question, not even, I'm not. I just don't think that is the scenario that we're going to be in after the next general election. But if it is, which is very but, possible, looking at these results, I honestly think Keir Starmer could literally be on the way to the palace in the car, having just been um, summoned to be prime minister of a majority party. And the Conservative Party and some parts of the media's talking points would still be, oh, it's a difficult night for the Conservatives, but Labour no, could have done better, come what, on. I, I'll give you my word that if that is a scenario that happens, <laughs> I will not be asking these questions. However, in these scenarios where the results point towards a hung parliament, it is a legitimate question to answer. No, I, no, I think we're, this, is a, this is a process, not an event. We're not at the final destination yet in terms of the general we're election. We're it out, there, And, take, and let, just give you a couple of examples as to why we shouldn't read the local elections um, right across. Take Hull, where, uh, I say through gritted teeth, the Liberal Democrats did rather well. I heard the Lib Dem leader of Hull Council the other night saying, well, look, locally people have voted Lib Dem, but at the general election, people in this city vote Labour. In Worcester, where, again, mildly through gritted teeth, the Greens did rather well. Again, I heard the Greens saying, well, local elections, we fight locally, but in the general election, this will be a Labour versus Conservative fight, and I'm confident that we will win Worcester for, for Labour. Um, but we're not complacent about this, and there's so much more still to come. Keir Starmer's going to be setting out Labour's stall in terms of our big mission to not just cut NHS waiting lists, but build an NHS fit for the future later this month. That'll be followed Let's again talk. by a bit edu education opportunity, uh, in terms of educational opportunities, narrowing the gap, um, in life chances between kids from working class backgrounds like mine and more wealthier backgrounds. There's so much more that Labour has in store and so much ambition well, we have for our country then, and right? that's how we'll win the next general election. Let's talk about this, shall we? Because if you are going to be the government in waiting, you're going to need some big radical uh, ideas. Uh, last week, Keir Starmer told me that the NHS isn't on its knees, it's on its face. So what's the big radical idea for the NHS? Are you willing to take on the vested interests? So as well as delivering the biggest expansion of NHS staff in history, funded by abolishing the non-DOM tax status, more doctors, more nurses, more NHS how staff to bring it, down... How, how much does that um, raise the non-DOM tax status? Uh, just over £3 billion and the NHS... Because if you look at the overall budget, that's kind of... It's not exactly a huge injection of money, is it? Well, I'd just say, yeah, two things on that. Firstly, uh, we, we know that investment matters. The last Labour government showed that, but so does reform. Again, the last Labour government showed that too. We managed to deliver the lowest waiting lists and the highest patient satisfaction in history in the NHS by that combination of investment and reform. So to your big idea challenge, we have got to shift the focus of healthcare out of the hospital into the community. Because if we can fix the front door to the NHS in primary care, where GPs are currently overwhelmed, there are thousands fewer GPs now than there were before. We've got people waiting far too long to see a GP because the GPs we have are desperately overstretched and, and burned out. The GPs yeah, if, are... if we can get that front door to the NHS fixed, it means faster diagnosis, which means more effective treatment and less expensive because if you go and see a GP, it costs about 40 quid for an appointment. If you go to accident emergency, it costs about 360 pounds. So GPs you know, aren't good... convinced by your plans though. And the BMA have told me that, you know, you're not, they're not sure that you'll really understand the house service. Well, we're winning people around, I think it's fair to say, in terms of general practice. I spent a lot of time, not just during the election campaign, but previously, actually out in general practice, talking to GPs and the wide range of staff um, who work there. I think they, they, un they get the most important thing, which is we recognise that they're 
they're stretched, there aren't enough of them. Uh, we need to get the cavalry in to support them. But I think they also see, and I did a big speech at the King's Fund just weeks ago, that if we're serious about having an NHS that fit for the future, that means having better community health services, faster access to primary care, so that we can do faster diagnosis, more effective and less expensive treatment, which is should, better for um, patients and better for the taxpayer. Should private sector involvement in the NHS be a dirty word? Uh, no, I mean, we, we're going to have to use the private sector to bring down um, NHS waiting lists. Um, the last Labour government did that very successfully. That was, that was part of the picture. I, I think the anger I feel today is that so many people are feeling forced to go private because the NHS is unable to get to them in time. And that's created a two-tier system where those who can pay are seen faster and those who can't are left behind. And that's why I've said, you know, we would use the private sets to bring down NHS waiting lists because for me, it's not just a pragmatic point, it's a point of principle. Why should someone who's working class or, you know, short of cash be left behind while their next door neighbour is able to be seen faster? But I see that as a, as a, as a measure on the path to making the NHS so good that no one feels forced to go private, because that's what happened under the last Labour government. Use of the private sector fell over the course of that government because the NHS was so good, people said, well, why pay? The NHS is there. OK, well, if you are a uh, health secretary after the general election, we'll have come back and we'll see if the NHS is... And, but the honestly, state of the so NHS people then. are still be saying, oh, but could Keir Starmer have done better? Oh, yeah. Um, well, let's have a see. Let's see. We'll, 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 we'll talk about the election results as they come in, as we will do with the government I'll as well. I'll see you there. Uh, now, with more scrutiny, there's always scrutiny about past pledges, about um, people changing their minds. And I just want to play you one uh, quick uh, clip of... I think you'll probably know where I'm going with this one, but just have a quick listen. There's no easy way to say this. We made a pledge, we didn't stick to it, and for that I am sorry. When you've made a mistake... Now, Labour has ditched its pledge to scrap tuition fees. Are you getting the cameras in for your own sorry video? <laughs> uh, look, I think the, the important thing is learning from the Liberal Democrats' experience. You don't go into a general election making promises you can't keep. And we're not prepared to do that. And the truth is the public finances are in such a mess that there are lots of things that we would like to do that, in all honesty, we don't think we will be able to afford to do. Now, I think I was talking to you back in the day when I was president of the National Union of Students about some of these issues. Um, I, I've never supported the tuition fee system the way it is. It's actually become worse, more unfair on students and graduates since I was president of NUS about 15 years ago. Um, and we want a fairer funding system. Uh, and that's what Labour will be setting out plans so will for. will you say sorry to those people who voted for Keir Starmer in the leadership election on this pledge that he then broke? Well, they're Labour Party members, and I think Labour Party members totally understand where we are as a party. Will you say sorry to people who voted on a false pledge? I don't, well, no, I think people know that in terms of what Keir Starmer stood to be leader of the Labour Party on the platform he stood on, making Labour electable again, getting us back to power so we can do things, Labour members absolutely support Keir Starmer in that. And they will understand better than anyone else because they're out there knocking on doors. They're a huge part of achieving those results we saw on Thursday night. They know that more than anything else, it's important that when people pick up Labour's manifesto and they look at our pledges and they look at how they'll pay for them because it'll be fully costed and fully funded, they, they know that voters need to know that we can deliver every single one of those pledges. And if Keir is looking at the state of the economy and the public finances with Rachel Reeves and concluding there are things that he would have liked to do but can't afford to do, far better to make those big judgment calls now before a general election than end up apologising after a general election to the British people like Nick Clegg was forced to do. Look what happens to the Lib Dems. We're not going to make those mistakes. We will set out plans for a fairer funding system, though, because I don't think anyone in the Labour Party thinks the status quo we see for students today, where they feel real hardship in their pockets, or graduates who pay their student loans off but still see the bill rising um, year, year after year, we know that's not a fair funding system. We'll set out our fully costed, fully funded plans for what we can do on higher education and student finance. But the reassuring point, Labour will not have promises in our manifesto that we can't pay for and keep. OK, thank you. Thanks. We're streeting there on pretty buoyant uh, form after those results. But across England, it was a different story for the Conservatives, who lost 49 councils and more than 1,000 councillors, which exceeded even their worst predictions. Well, a few moments ago, I spoke to the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser. Thanks so much for being on the programme. So you were there at the coronation yesterday. Any particular highlights? 
Uh, I was. It was just, uh, everything was so fabulous. A huge advert uh, for Global Britain, you know, a, a spectacle watched by uh, millions of people across, across the globe. Uh, I really loved the procession because, you know, you saw everything there, you know, religious leaders, you know, uh, leaders of their countries in their traditional dress. And then, you know, you saw Sh Princess Charlotte with Prince Louis holding hands. I just thought that was a, a huge moment of, you know, international solidarity. Yeah, that was lovely, that moment when they were holding hands I thought as well and you've got a busy day today as well planned. Busy day today so um, yes later on I'll be going uh, with the Prime Minister to the luncheon number 10 where I'll be hosting people uh, you know who've been made massive contributions to their uh, to their local communities um, and there'll be some Ukrainians there as well so that's going to be a really fabulous event and then really lucky to be invited tonight to the coronation concert <coughs> uh, which will show the best of our British culture. I mean, it's been an amazing weekend of spectacle, but frankly, it has been a difficult few years for the royal family. Some might be asking if they're still relevant. I think they make a massive contribution to society. You know, just yesterday, you know, seeing 200 uh, representatives from across the globe there because of the coronation, um, I think that shows their, their power and their pull. And they do so much, you know, for communities, uh, the good works that they do. You know, I work uh, uh, very closely with the Princess Trust, you know, what they're doing uh, for young people. So I do think they have a significant role uh, in society. Mm. Not everyone agrees, of course. There were a number of arrests uh, yesterday. Do you think the Met Police went too far? Uh, no, the, the police are operationally independent uh, from government, but I, what they had to do was to police, you know, an international event uh, on the world stage, and I think they took that into account in their policing. And what they have to do is balance the right of people's, uh, the right to protest, which is important in a democracy, uh, at the same time as the right of all those other people to enjoy what was a fabulous day. And, and I, I don't know the, the instances, the particular instances, but I think uh, overall they managed to get that balance right. I mean, you say that overall you believe they managed to get the balance right, um, but there are reports of, for example, three volunteers working for Westminster County's night safety team arrested for handing out rape alarms, another person arrested for possessing a megaphone because it might scare the horses. I mean, for some people, they might be saying that, hang on, um, yes, the people have a right to enjoy um, the coronation and the processions, but also people have a right at the coronation to also make their views heard if they're anti monarchy I think it's really difficult to take snapshots of particular cases because we don't know all the facts around that. We don't know whether events, for example, were coordinated. Uh, so I think it's, that's very, a very, very difficult analysis to make. But I think what we've seen in this country is a, a rise in protests and the way people are protesting that is interfering with the rights of people to go around their daily life. You know, it's stopping ambulances, uh, stopping people get to school, uh, stopping people going on motorways and getting to work. And I think we need to redress that. And that's what we've done in Parliament to bring in new laws to ensure that the balance is redressed and we get that balance right. I, mean, I, I want to talk about that in a minute, um, but that's not what we saw, is it, at the coronation protest? I think that's quite important to say. Uh, the Met Police uh, said that they understand the concern, but they police proportionately and in the context of the event. I just wonder that phrase, in the context of the event, does that mean there are different thresholds for policing of protests around coronation? Well, we should say, I, I know the police said that they understand the public concerns, but there were a large number of protests uh, that took place uh, yesterday uh, with the police knowledge that were able to go ahead. I think it is really important that they take into account the context of, uh, of the event, because this was an event that would have raised questions about national security. This was an event on the world stage, and I think it is really important for the police to put that, uh, their policing into that context. Um, you mentioned the extra powers that you've given to the police to police protests, including powers to stop and search without suspicion, including saying that uh, policemen may stop any person or vehicle that they see, think fit to, whether or not they have any grounds for suspecting the person's carrying a prohibited object. Do you trust the police to use these new powers fairly? Uh, well, if they don't use them fairly, then there are consequences. So, yes, I mean, I think policing is very difficult. The police are operationally independent. They have difficult challenges. But do uh, you trust them to use these new powers? 
Yes, I do trust them to use those new, new powers. I've had a number of meetings with the police over the course of the last uh, few weeks, obviously uh, in relation to the coronation, to check everything uh, they felt was on track. And I have huge confidence uh, in the police. I mean, some of these protesters are, uh, we're talking generally now about uh, the reason yes, why we've yeah. brought in this legislation. Mm -hmm. I mean, over the last year, the police have spent £14 million dealing with Just Stop oil protests. I think it's absolutely right. Uh, that they have the powers that they need in order to ensure that people can go to go on their day-to-day -day lives at the same time as respecting people's right to protest. I guess I'm asking the question specifically about the police because, you know, we've just seen a very important review saying that they had met police as institutionally racist and misogynistic. More than 90 officers found guilty of crimes themselves last year from violence to sexual assault offences, public confidence, understandably, at a real low. Is this the time to be giving the police more powers? Uh, well, we, you asked me a question about their operational uh, ability. Of course, the police have had a difficult time and the reviews that you have mentioned um, and the unfortunate instance, uh, you know, have taken place and there have been there have been reviews to ensure that there's more police vetting, uh, which is absolutely right. Um, obviously, police should be uh, respecting um, the, the people that they deal with, witnesses, victims and women. Um, and uh, I think those steps are now being taken. OK. I want to move on to the local elections, if I may. Um, how would you describe your performance? Well, first of all, I would like to say, you know, lots of councillors have lost their seat from, from a variety of parties and they've worked really hard uh, in their local communities. And, of course, that is a real shame. One party in particular, though, wouldn't you say? Well, you're right to say that we, we have been in government now for 13 years. We've been, if we could look at the context for the whole uh, local election, uh, we've been in power for a long time. Uh, we've just had a pandemic which has disrupted many people's lives uh, and has had consequences for the economy, as has the war in Ukraine, uh, which is going on. And we understand the concerns uh, of the British people. You know, what we're focusing on now is ensuring that we cut inflation and we're having some success there, you know, cut the debt, uh, grow the economy and make sure that we protect the NHS. You know, it, it's it's... Sometimes I, f I feel like the last couple of days listening to Conservative politicians reflect on the results. Do you really get what's happened? Totally, totally. It's really important that we listen to people. I know people are frustrated this and isn't angry. isn't just midterm blues, is it? This isn't just, oh, look, we've had 13 years. Of course we're going to dip a few seats. Like, hundreds and hundreds of seats were lost by the Conservatives. Yes. Labour now, yes. the largest party in local government. I mean, they were, you were losing all over the place. Medway, Windsor... Basically, anyone who's up against you, Greens even, were taking seats. Do you, do you get what's happening? We've had a... Totally. And we've had a really, really... On top of the things I've mentioned, I totally recognise we've had a really difficult few years. I do think that the Prime Minister, who's now been in office for six months, is getting the country back on track and is delivering. And I think we're starting to gain the trust of the British public. What, but we have, we have, you know, we have what, absolutely What's your evidence for that, that you're gaining the trust of the British public? They've well, just rejected you at the local elections. Um, well, uh, in my own seat, obviously I've spent a large number of hours knocking on doors and speaking to people across my constituency. And I've seen a little bit of a shift in the last, even from the beginning of the campaign to the end of the campaign. You know, they were angry and frustrated and the cost of living is difficult. But I think what they are seeing, uh, and I hope what they're seeing, is that the Prime Minister is starting to deliver in a quiet way for the British people. And just, just to come on to the other parties, you know, uh, Labour didn't have, it did well, um, I, I accept that, but if it wants to get uh, a majority at the next election, it needed to do better. So, you know, the statistics show that if to win uh, at a general election in the previous local election, you need to be 13, 14 points up, and they were around eight points up. So they do need to do better. Look, we can have a debate over whether or not these results show that Labour is on course for a minority or majority government, but what the results show is that you guys are on course to being turfed out. So we've got some way to go. We need to continue working hard. Uh, I totally understand that we need to do better and I think we are uh, going to deliver that. I mean, I, mean, I must say, um, and, and I totally recognise that uh, we could have done much better and the results were not good. But, you know, in my own constituency, we were facing... Um, we, we, we held the council by 
uh, one seat previously, and we still hold the council. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are areas in the country where the results were OK. So how are you going to change then? If you're listening to what the voters are saying, and I, I read in the papers that you are apparently the cabinet minister who topped the league table for doing the most <laughs> campaigning out and about. So you're the one talking to voters, you're listening to them. If you're hearing their message, how does your government need to change? We need to deliver on what matters to people. And I think what matters most to them is their day-to-day -day spending and the cost of living. And our, our key focus is getting inflation down. So no change then? Fingers and ears? Because that's what you just said before, right? Uh, well, we need to deliver. People need to see that we're a government that says what it's going to do and then it delivers it. So that's what we've said we're going to do. And we've started on that journey but we need to deliver it. Um, and then I think once we have delivered it and people have seen progress, then we earn their trust back and we can start talking to them and delivering on other things as well. Some of your colleagues think that the change needs to be a bit more rapid, frankly. Um, I've spoken to some Conservative MPs who say that Rishi Sunak has a problem. John Redwood has been busy tweeting this morning. Not Rishi Sunak's biggest fan, it must be said, but look, this is just one of his uh, tweets that we can have a look at. Last Thursday, many Conservative voters went on strike they don't want to vote for higher taxes, anti-enterprise policies and a failure to take back control of our borders. He went on to say, if taxes have to be this high, why are public services not better? Well, I think, well, first of all, I worked with Rishi for a year in the Treasury uh, and I think he's outstanding at delivering. He's decent, hardworking and I think he is showing he's capable of delivering and he scores well in the polls. So I think he's doing a good job. Obviously, there's still more we need to do. We are doing those things. What? Uh, we are Lowering doing taxes. those things. Well, the best, the biggest tax cut we can make is a cut in inflation. That's that's not really what John Redwood's talking about, though, is it? He's talking about the tax burden. Well, I'd like to see. Well, the decade. most important thing is what do people feel? Like, how do they feel the economy is affecting them? And a cut in inflation is the biggest tax cut uh, they can get. We are. It's not taking... actually a tax cut, is it? You can't say you're delivering what he wants because he's asking for tax cuts. <laughs> well, you know, what, what I think is important is that people feel the effect in their pocket. So. You know, the first step of that is to cut inflation. Uh, we are taking back control of our borders. You know, you will know we're taking on legislation. You'll know we've done a deal with Albania. You'll know we're working with the French. You know, we are making sure that we stop the boats and we take control um, of our immigration and the, um, uh, ensure that people come here, come here uh, legally and through safe routes. OK, I just want to talk a little bit with your media hat on, if I may as well. And I spoke to Keir Starmer last weekend, who said that there are still outstanding issues when it comes to regulation of the media and press. Is he right? Uh, well, I think well, I'm very proud of our media. Um, I think it's a, we are a democracy and it's really important that we have uh, free speech. You'll know I'm also in charge of the BBC and uh, I think the BBC is a, a huge asset uh, to this country. Uh, we will be repealing Section 40 um, and uh, to ensure uh, that the media continues to have that ability uh, to hold uh, politicians and others to account. I mean, there has been a lot of scrutiny, hasn't there, of the BBC recently uh, with the resignation of Richard Sharp, the chairman. Is it time, as Keir Starmer is saying, to take all political interference out of that role? No. Um, and I think it's interesting he says that because when Labour is in power, they made political appointments. Yeah, but he wants to do a different thing, doesn't he? He's, not, he's saying that, look, let's just change the whole thing going forward. The, the BBC a charter sets out how the BBC chairman is appointed and we will be following the BBC charter. But what's really important to state is that in selecting the next chair of the BBC, we will be looking for the best candidate. And that will be our focus. Who is the, going to be the best chair of the BBC? And if they happen to have political allegiances or they've supported a party in the past, whether that is the Conservative Party or the Labour Party or indeed any other party, I don't think that should disqualify them if they are the best candidate for the job. But that's the problem, isn't it? I guess people are questioning whether or not the best candidate for the job has always been the criteria. No, the, 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 the criteria on which I will be appointing, and I'm sure the Prime Minister will be appointing the next chair of the BBC, is the best candidate for the job, and I do not think... So they might be a Labour supporter. I then. strongly believe uh, that we should not disqualify people from public office who put themselves forward, who are capable of doing a good job, because they happen to have in the past supported a political so party. So you'll be looking at Labour candidates and Conservative candidates? I'll be candidates looking at the best equally. candidate for the job. OK. Eurovision next weekend. Yes. What's your prediction? 
I, <laughs> I don't make predictions. Uh, I'm really looking Come forward. Come on, I won't hold you to I'm it. really looking forward to going. Um, I'm, I'm really, and, and it's not just actually about Eurovision and the song contest. Uh, the city of Liverpool has done a phenomenal job of uh, supporting and promoting Ukrainian culture. I've spoken to the Ukrainian culture minister a number of times and really looking forward to hosting him as well. And I think it's just going to be a huge celebration, recognising the huge tragedy that's going on in Ukraine at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you saw there the difficult questions about the election results for the Conservatives. Well, the numbers make a slightly different reading, shall we say, for the Liberal Democrats, because they now control 16 councils, and it's perhaps where they won that matters most, because throughout the so-called Blue Wall, they picked up seats in traditional Conservative areas, Windsor and Maidenhead, Hertfordshire, Stratford-upon-Avon. And those areas currently have Conservative MPs, so the next challenge is turning those into general election votes. Well, we're joined by the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Stacey Cooper. Good to have you on the show this morning. Thank you. Um, I just want to start off with the coronation. It feels like such a big story this weekend, doesn't it? What were you doing yesterday? Ah, I was watching it on the television at home. Uh, I thought the, the colours, the, the music, everything, it's just a fantastic um, spectacle. It's fantastic to watch. Are you a bit of a royalist or...? Do you know what? I think in this country we've got lots of people who are staunch royalists and some who are sort of staunch republicans. Mm. I put myself sort of somewhere in the middle. You know, mm. as a politician, it won't surprise you that the things that worry me day to day are things like the cost of living. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about the police handling of some of the protests as well. Um, Lucy Fraser, the Culture Secretary, said in that interview she thought the police got the balance right between allowing people to celebrate the coronation without being disturbed and allowing people to protest peacefully. Do you think the police got the balance right? Um, I've got concerns that they may not have done. Uh, we still need to see some more information coming out about what's actually happened. Some of that information is unfolding, but on the face of it, I do have concerns. Uh, the fact is that in this country, when it, whether you're a royalist or whether you are a Republican, we should all be able to agree on uh, free speech and the right to protest. There is a distinction between peaceful protest on the one hand and disruptive and um, uh, you know, violent protest on the other. What concerns me is that the Conservative government have introduced very far ranging uh, sweeping powers for the police, which affects all protests. I think what we may have seen uh, yesterday, but we still don't know, what we may have seen uh, is some of those um, new measures are being used by the police. I think that puts the public in a difficult position. I think it put the, puts the police in a difficult position too. I you're right to say that some of these details need to be investigated and followed through, but there have been talk of people handing out rape alarms, for example, uh, being arrested, someone with a megaphone being arrested. Graham Smith, the head of Republic, tweeted to say, now that he's out of the police station, make no mistake, there is no longer the right to peaceful protest in the UK. I mean, that is an incredibly troubling statement. Uh, the fact is that during the course of the government's policing bill and also through the public order bill, Liberal Democrats made the point that actually the police have all the powers that they need. They've always had powers to deal with disruptive and violent uh, protest. I think what worries me is that the Conservative government have now increased these sort of wide ranging powers to police all protests. What they haven't done is enshrined the sort of legal responsibility and the duty on the police to actually facilitate peaceful process. I was part of a, a cross-party group in Parliament that actually looked at this issue. We took, ev we took uh, evidence from uh, people from the Met and from protesters uh, in the wake of the Sarah Everard uh, vigil where the policing was found in court to have been uh, handled really badly. Um, and as a result of that inquiry that we led, uh, we said there should be a, a code of conduct um, around how protests should be policed in this country. We're clearly a very long way from getting the balance right. I mean, I guess, look, to put the other side of this, right, we have seen in recent years very disruptive protests, mm. which have been made it difficult for ambulances to get through, to people to you know, make it to important hospital appointments mm -hmm. because of the disruptive nature of those protests. That is what the government would say they're trying to stop. Um, I absolutely condemn those kinds of protests. I mean, if, if I had been that woman, which I saw on the television, who was in her car desperately trying to get to see her mother mm -hmm. in a hospital, I, you know, I would have been uh, probably even more uh, angry than that, that particular woman was. So, of course, um, whether you've got violent and disruptive protests, there have to be the powers to deal with that, but those powers have already existed. I think what we've seen is the government has introduced these new powers that apply to all types of protest, and therefore there is a real kind of chilling effect on the right to peaceful protest, I think it's time that the government was a lot more clear about ensuring that the police have a responsibility to uphold and facilitate peaceful protest in this country. And we need a proper code of conduct so the public knows where they stand and the police know where they stand so we can retain trust in the police as well. OK. Um, I want to talk about the local elections. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a pretty bumper 
set of results, uh, shall we say, improving even on your 2019 performance, which was a pretty high bar. I can see you smiling. Um, how would you describe them? Well, um, it was a record-breaking set of results for us um, and we really did uh, exceed all of our own expectations. Um, I think what we can say is that we've obviously taken control of a number of uh, councils and this weekend there'll be a number of the Conservative big beasts, you know, Michael Gove, uh, Jeremy Hunt, former Prime Minister, Theresa May, uh, even Nadim Zahawi, who will have woken up to having a Liberal Democrat run council and they'll be looking over their shoulder knowing that we're now coming for their parliamentary seats at the next general election. So are you the opposition then to the Conservatives in some of these, the blue wall? Absolutely. There are many places around the country, around 80 seats, where the Liberal Democrats are the key challengers to the Conservatives. We call it the blue wall area and we hope very much at the next general election to win as many of those seats as possible. I mean, I guess some would say, let's not get too carried away. The Lib Dems always do well in local elections and historically you really haven't managed to break through that much in terms of parliamentary seats. Well, you know, I'm from St Albans, I'm the MP for St Albans, and if you look at what happened there in 2019, we took control of the council um, in the summer months, and then just a few months later, we won the parliamentary seat as well. So there is, you know, I, I am living proof of the fact that you can win at the local level, and then using that as a springboard to actually win a parliamentary seat as well. And that's certainly a model we'll be using in many other places across the country. So the re results themselves pointed, according to Sky News analysis, to Labour being the largest party, but short of a majority. I just want to have a look at a picture from the, co uh, from the coronation, uh, if I may, I think we can have a look at that. Keir Starmer there and Ed Davey sitting next to each other. They were having a bit of a chat at one point. Do you think there sort of could be a deal between these two guys? I mean, look, let's be honest. If I was an athlete and I said to you, I've got 12 months until I have to run the race of my life, and a journalist said to the athlete, well, what are you going to do the day after? The athlete would rightly say, look, I'm just focused on that particular race. And we're in exactly the same position as politicians. As a Liberal Democrat deputy leader, I'm working with Ed to put our party on a general election footing. We have got a laser-like focus on trying to get as many Liberal Democrat MPs elected as possible when the general election comes. Um, and we're just not even contemplating or thinking about what might happen after that. At the same time, though, I'm not sure I buy it because you've previously ruled out a coalition with the Conservatives. Why won't you rule one out with Labour? Well, because the Conservatives are in power at the moment. It's it, abundantly clear for us to see. That's not... Um... You know, relevant, is it? Oh, absolutely. You're it talking is. about potentials. You're saying you're not talking about this because it's a, a possibility rather than a reality. Why won't you rule out Labour if you're prepared to rule out with Conservatives? Day in, day out, we can see the damage that the Conservative Party are doing to our country. You know, whether it's the NHS that they're just driving into the ground, whether it's um, you know the blowing a hole in the nation's finances, whether it's you know continuing to allow water companies to pump sewage into rivers and onto our beaches, we can see the damage the Conservative Party are doing. And the reason that we've had those three stunning election wins is because lifelong Conservative voters are voting for the Liberal Democrats in part because they want to get rid of this Conservative government. It is our responsibility, our moral responsibility, we believe, to oust the Conservative, uh, oust as many Conservative MPs as possible. But as regards to Labour, I mean, they will stand on their own, uh, on, on their own platform and we will stand on our own platform. We won't be defined by another party. We have our own set of our open Liberal values. We're internationalists, we're environmentalists, you know, we're, we're pro-business, we're pro-public sector, we believe in devolving power to local communities. This is the platform that we will stand on and we'll use every opportunity between now and the general election to make the case for voting Liberal Democrats. So it sounds to me like you would consider doing a deal with Labour. As I say, um, we have ruled out working with the Conservatives yeah. because of the damage they're doing to the country. But you haven't ruled out working with Labour. Everything we do between now and the general election will be about focusing on getting Liberal Democrat MPs elected. Yeah, but that's not the question I asked, though, is it? Well, that's what we're planning to do. Everything between now and the general election is getting Liberal Democrat MPs elected. Would a change to the voting system be a red line in any Lib Dem deal? Well, it will certainly be in our manifesto. I mean, it's been in our manifesto almost every single election, I think probably almost every election, uh, since the formation of the party. And um, at the moment, we have an incredibly unfair voting system where you know, the political parties themselves focus on a very small number of votes in particular seats. And a number of people feel very disenfranchised. So it's very important to us as Liberal Democrats that we, um, that we do have a fairer voting system. It'll be in our manifesto and certainly, you know... Part of any discussion. Well, it's a, it'll be in our manifesto and it's a priority for the party. It always has been, it always will be. How about rejoining the EU? Is that over then for the Lib Dems? Uh, well, we would love to have the UK back at the heart uh, of Europe. We've set out a four-stage plan as to how we want to do that. Uh, there are two very easy steps that the government of the day could take today, improving our current trade deal and rejoining you know, other programmes, whether it's education or science. How about the single market? 
Well, that's part of our four-stage plan. Eventually, we would like to end up in the single market. We shouldn't underestimate, though, how much damage to the trust and relationship we have the EU, with the EU the Conservatives have actually done. The damage has been really, really devastating. I think as and when we... Well, they have managed to get a deal through recently, haven't they? And actually, EU leaders tell me that, you know, they find Rishi Sunak someone that they can deal with. Well, they can deal with, yes, but in terms of, you know, rebuilding their relationship with the UK as a whole, I think there's been a, there's been a huge amount of damage done by this Conservative government. Liberal Democrats want us to have the UK at the heart uh, of Europe, and we've got that four-stage plan which will take us into the single market. OK. Now, last weekend I asked Keir Starmer if Arsenal were going to win the Premier League. He said no. St Albans City, a few leagues down from St Albans, uh, from uh, Arsenal, um, they're in the playoffs today. Are you confident they might get promotion? Oh, fingers crossed. I'm pretty sure they will. Come on, the Saints. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, lovely. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Daisy Keeper there uh, for the Liberal Democrats. So busy uh, programme uh, today. Lots uh, on the coronation. It does feel like there's been a bit of a difference in views on the policing of those protests in particular, with Lucy Fraser for the Conservatives saying that the police got the balance right, but Daisy Cooper there saying that actually she does have some concerns about how uh, those protests uh, were. She's quite careful in not ruling out uh, a coalition uh, with the Labour Party uh, as well, I thought. Now, as usual, The Take will follow this programme just after 9.30. Our chance to analyse today's interviews, talk through any news lines with our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. Now, normally at this point you have a nice view of Sam's living room, Today he's here in person. He's alive. He exists. He's a real person. <laughs> here in 3D. Um, you know it's a big weekend when you come into the studio. Um, what's your sort of take on all the local election news around? I mean, all the parties are kind of reeling from what was quite a dramatic result. I was struck that Lucy Fraser blamed COVID mm. and the Ukraine war for the very poor showing by the Conservatives, worse than the uh, worst expectations uh, set by uh, the academics. But the one thing that stood out more than anything else was the way that Labour and West Streeting in this studio has responded to it. Now, I thought West Streeting was on quite fighty form, attacking questions about whether or not they were going to get an overall majority or not. They sort of say that they're illegitimate. I think it's quite an important tactic that's going on that leads them to do that because they want to scare the media off. They want to scare the public off this conversation about what would happen if they didn't quite get enough seats to have more than half the MPs in the House of Commons, because then they'd have to have discussions, do deals with other political parties. And they don't want to get into that territory. They fear the Conservatives will exploit that. So in order to do that, they just say that's not an issue. It is. The questions are legitimate. It's unclear what they would do. And it's no good just attacking the media for asking the question. Yeah, I thought he was, um, yeah, like you say, fighty form, uh, certainly. And it was quite interesting as well, listening to Daisy Cooper, very carefully not ruling anything out as well, and talking about changes to the voting system as a priority for her party as well. These are the kind of things we're going to start talking about more. Absolutely. The Liberal Democrats have, have been quite open about it. They could never put a Conservative Prime Minister in number 10 in, in a hung parliament. There is no way on the basis of their campaign, their message, stopping just short of saying it, but on the basis of what they've said, there's absolutely no way. That's a big problem for the Conservatives. Almost nobody would put Rishi Sunak back in number 10 in the event that there's a hung parliament. The political scene is changing. Uh, we'll have more from Sam uh, later on uh, in the hour. But in the meantime, we've just been talking about the challenge facing the Conservatives this morning. You know, they've suffered a serious defeat in the local elections. And of course, as Sam was saying, with the general election due next year, they remain consistently behind in the polls. The question now is how or can they even turn things around? We're joined by the Conservative MP, former Minister Jackie Doyle Price. Uh, thank you for being on the programme this morning. I mean, over a, a thousand seats lost. Medway, Windsor, East Staffordshire, pretty much everywhere, people are taking seats off the Conservatives. They are, but, but frankly, I still would have expected uh, the Labour Party to be doing much, much better than they did on Thursday. I mean, if we look uh, locally here, a lot of the gains were made by independents rather than by the Labour Party. And if Labour were an absolute shoo-in to get a majority at the next election, they should have been romping home. But what we've actually seen is an anti-Conservative vote uh, split between Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens and Independents, which tells you that, really, the jury is still out on us. And what happens at the next general election is entirely due to what the Conservative Party does between now and then. I just want to pick up, because there's lots of questions and debate about the size of Labour's win. Is it enough to get to a majority? But it feels to me like, you know, the real message was the rejection of the Conservative Party. Like you say, you lost to almost everybody, Independents, the Labour Party the Greens, the Lib Dems, all that points towards is the Conservatives losing power. Do you think your party's really woken up to that? 
I think what it points to, Sophie, is the shocking 18 months the Conservative Party has had. And frankly, you know, we've reduced uh, we've, we've reduced politics to a soap opera over the last 18 months. Immediately prior to that, we were master of all we surveyed. So I don't blame the electorate for being cross with us. I don't blame them for giving us kicking. But the Conservative Party has a brand which is grown up and competent. And that's what we need to recover. I still think we're very much in play at uh, the next general election, but it depends very much on what we do between now and then. And what do you think you should do then? Well, we now have a, a new leadership. We have a we have a narrative, which I think we need to look very carefully at that narrative and go back to first principles about what we believe in as Conservatives, which is, you know, people be able to keep more of what they earn and the state only spending when it can do so effectively. I think we need to become more disciplined. I, you know, frankly, I'm horrified to see that people want to wait to, to put us through another leadership election as if four in a year would be more, uh, not too many. Um, we need to just unite and start being grown up and start delivering. And we need to stop bickering amongst ourselves. We need to stop focusing on big personalities. And we need to get on with the business of government. It's that simple. That's what the public expects. The public don't want to see you know, battles in the news. They just want to be able to be confident that the government's doing its best to deliver. And that's not what they've seen for the last 18 months. You said there about people being able to keep more of what they earn. Do you think that there should be a reduction in taxes then? Well, I think we need to have a sensible discussion about public spending. Um, there is no doubt, obviously, when, with what we had to do to combat COVID, that was going to uh, lead to uh, spending a lot of money. That money needs to be paid back. We cannot live beyond our means. And I'm afraid what the Conservative Party has done is it's chased after the Labour Party on its own territory. It's allowing itself to be uh, defined by how much it spends on things rather than what it delivers. And, you know, if you think, think back to the narrative at the last general election when we were talking about, you know, 50,000 more nurses and um, more hospitals. That isn't what it's about. It's about being able to deliver the best services with the money at hand. And we are now in a position where our tax rates are uncompetitive. Uh, they are limiting growth. Uh, the way we've handled our economic policy isn't incentivising investment in productivity. And that's what we need to be. That's the Conservative Party about nothing if it's not about economic competence. And I'm afraid we are we have let ourselves, due to lots of circumstances, be fighting on an issue, on a debate about public spending. We're never going to win that. We can't out Labour Labour by how much they spend because we recognise that tax has to be competitive. And you know, it, again, I come back to my original point. Start governing like Conservatives and we will be re-elected as Conservatives. I asked Lucy Fraser about taxes and she said that bringing inflation down would be a tax cut. Do you think that's enough? Um, what, I, what I would say is that I do trust Jeremy Hunt to uh, have a sensible economic policy which isn't reckless. I think we should do all we can to reduce taxes. Uh, I, you Are you know, doing all you can to reduce taxes now? I think we need to have sensible debates about spending and sensible debates about what we're doing to, you know, release economic activity. Um, I would, I would like to hope that if we carry on as we are going, we can, you know, go back to where we were and and start reducing taxes. And I trust Jeremy Hunt to be able to do that because he is a good conservative. And just finally, um, you know, I've been interviewing conservative frontbenchers and MPs since the results start to come in on Friday morning. And it does strike me that the line seems to be, we need to just deliver on what we're already doing. We just need to stick to the plan and keep delivering on what we're already doing. Do you think there is a risk that that doesn't really grasp the message that voters have just sent? Well, as I say, I think the, the message that voters have just sent is about, is about the history uh, of the last 18 months. Uh, I think it's also about the fact that, you know, for people who are used to voting Conservative, they have an idea about what the Conservative Party is and we're not currently delivering on that. I mean, I got that on the door all the time. People do think that the government's spending uh, far too much uh, money. So, uh, I mean, in, in the sense that, you know, we have a narrative at the moment, um, I, I, I think that what the election results show on Thursday is that that's not quite cutting through and perhaps there is a case for rebooting that message. But but that's what happens after elections. You, you take stock about the message that you've been given and, and you act accordingly. But I think it's more about reassuring people that, you know, we are not 
going to carry on borrowing and spending in the way that we have. And we are going to refocus and be a good Conservative government that delivers economic competence, that doesn't overpromise, and that allows people to keep more of what they earn. OK, thank you very much indeed. Really interesting to talk to you uh, on the programme today. Jackie Ball, door prize there. Thank you very much. Well, we can reflect a bit now on what we've been talking about this morning and also look ahead to politics. I was going to say the political week to come, but really it's much more than that. It is the political year to come. We're going to be looking ahead to the next election uh, and the real challenges that have become pretty evident uh, since those local elections on Thursday. There's also lots on the agenda around the coronation too, and I'm joined by uh, two women who certainly know their way around Westminster, the former political advisor to Labour, Aisha Hazarika, and Sam Shah, who was a special advisor to the Conservative Home Secretary, Sajid Javid. Thanks for being on the show, both of you. Good morning. Hey. I mean, you were, I was just in the introduction there saying that you were a former advisor to Sajid Javid. I mean, his constituency area uh, was lost by the Conservatives. I mean, how much of a difficult night was it, do you think? Uh, I think there's no escaping the fact that a loss of over a thousand seats is a pretty significant hit for the Conservative mm -hmm. Party. And, you know, nobody's making any bones about that. It is this question of how you then sort of present this result to people. And the challenge from a tactical perspective is what happens when, as we've seen already, people like Boris Johnson are already trying to start, mm -hmm. you know, little skirmishes for the Prime Minister to have to deal with. And how do you create confidence within your own party after uh, results like this and keep the faith and keep them motivated to get to a general election. And so, you know, your previous interview, Jackie Doyle-Price, she's talking about sort of tax cuts and being a true Conservative. Uh, th there is no Conservative that would disagree with that, but principle is at some point going to hit reality, and that is what Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives at a national level are going to have to start considering. I guess what people like Jackie Doyle-Price might be feeling, though, is you can't just keep doing the same thing. This is Rishi Sunak's first test at the mm. ballot box, right, yeah. since becoming Prime Minister. And the message is quite clear. People don't like what he's offering. Yeah, and I think this is something that they're really going to have to start considering because obviously he came in as Prime Minister as the default choice after, I mean, let's not deny it, but Liz Truss messed up so badly. Um, and so far, he's been sort of ticking along, trying to sort of bring things back into good order. But the thing that he doesn't have and which he's been criticised for significantly, is that vision, is that sense of purpose, is that sense of hope, and that diagnosis of what is the problem and how, are, how is he the right guy to fix it? And I think there is that idea that being too technocratic is not really appealing to people. And if you're the government, you do have a little bit of power to set the agenda. I mean, you are the government at the end of the day. And there is a, that little bit of caution about thinking about that political messaging that I think is going to have to change mm. in this next year if he's got a, a chance of making these numbers move around a little bit to give himself, a, not a, potentially not a victory, but at least some damage control. Take a few more risks, yeah. basically. Um, how about Labour? Where's Streeting was a bit um, tetchy at some point, saying, look, even if Keir Starmer was on his way yeah, to meet I... the Queen, then you guys would still be questioning whether yeah, you've done I, enough. I, I saw that. I liked your answer, which is like, listen, if that, if that moment happens, yeah. I promise you are. <laughs> but look, I do think that... I think where there's a, definitely a little bit of truth to what where Streeting says, there is a bit of a, a, I think, a slightly retro narrative and a bit of a lazy narrative, just saying Labour's had, like, a really, really terrible night. And I think if you just take a step back... If you look at where Keir Starmer was just three years ago when he took over the Labour Party, and the party was completely in the toilet, and people like me who are really close Labour watchers, we didn't think Labour would be competitive for seriously about 10 years. So it's quite an achievement to be where we are. And of course, there's a big question about whether Labour is on course for a majority yet, and that's a definitely a legitimate thing to, to, to talk about. But I think we just need to, to look at a couple of, of facts which are really, really important. Labour did really well at these uh, elections. For the first time in a long time, there were more mm. Labour councillors than not. They were winning really interesting seats from Swindon, which is a real bellwether seat, to, to places like um, Medway. And however you cut it, it does look like the Conservatives are now in a very difficult death spiral. As you say, first time Rishi Sunak tested uh, at the ballot box went really badly. The fact that their expectation management of a thousand, losing a thousand seats became a self-fulfilling prophecy is really bad news. And the big takeaway, I think, for a lot of people is, unless something miraculously happens with Rishi Sunak mm. and the country, there is going to be a Labour Prime Minister. There's a high possibility that for the first time in 14 years come the next general election, 
there will be a Labour Prime Minister in Downing Street. And that is a big moment in terms of the narrative of British politics, because we have not been at this position for a long time. Even when I worked for Ed Miliband, you know, we were never, you know, talking really about the possibility of a majority Labour government. Yes, right towards the end of the election, we thought there could be maybe a hung parliament or, or Labour being the largest party. And of course, these election results didn't take into, a fact, uh, into account, um, it's Scotland into account. And things have changed massively in Scotland. So in I Scotland, would... though, just want to pick you up on that, because I think I'm right in saying that Labour haven't got a majority since the 1950s without winning at least 40 seats in Scotland. You've got one at the minute. I mean, even if you do well at Scotland, it's a bit of a tall order to be relying well, on Scotland, right? I think the, the mood has changed in Scotland a lot. And I think even if La look, Labour was only hoping to maybe pick up between six and ten seats, mm -hmm. if that now goes up, let's say, post-20, that's quite a tipping point in terms of helping, you know, get to that sort of majority. But look, having said all of that... Labour should absolutely not be punching the air and measuring up the curtains because political history tells us that it's very, very difficult for Labour to cross the line. You know, we've people like me who've been around the Labour Party for a long time know that. And I think the party, uh, the country is falling out of love with the Conservative Party. The question for Keir Starmer's mm. strategists, are they in love with Keir mm. Starmer yet? And I think where there is a legitimate question for the Labour Party is right you have to sort of flesh out a bit more of a, a positive vision. You don't want to just scrape a win because you're not the Conservatives. You do want a positive, mm. compelling mandate from the British public, arguably not just for one term, but for two terms. And you want to start making that positive case now. Um, I want to talk to you both a bit about the coronation. Did you watch it? Yes. yes. <laughs> Look at that. That I was, was a Buckingham, Buckingham, near Buckingham Palace. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> um, it was quite an amazing day, wasn't it? Um, was there any sort of standout moments for either of you? That... I'm afraid for me the standout moment was a new queen has been crowned and her name is Penny Morden. I have Penny to say, Morden. Penny Morden stole the show. Penny Morden, I think, actually, I have to say, like, no matter what side of the political yeah. divide you're on, Penny Morden there, carrying the sword. I mean, look at the guns on that. I That's know, impressive. two tickets to the gun show. People are calling her Penny Sword and... <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they're yeah. doing? Penny yeah. Sword and... I mean, it could have been Chris Grayley, not quite the same impact. I or think. Jacob Rees-Mogg. <laughs> I don't think Jacob Rees-Mogg would have had the arm strength to, to, to harry, carry that sword. I mean, it, it was really interesting because I was covering it for, for American Network and they were going absolutely nuts about who Penny Morden was. They were like, who, who is this person? But, you know... She, I think she she had a standout moment, but it was a very it was sort of what Brits do do best. I mean, it was bejeweled, it was opulent, the music was incredible. It was a bit mad at times, it was a bit bonkers, but there was that great thing of fusing all that ancient tradition and, and ritual with some quite nice modern touches uh, as well. Look, we haven't had one for seventy years, and I think that it's one of those moments that actually, where people, if they do watch it, go. Oh, that's what the monarchy's about. Because in between all of that, you get like weddings and things and people's life moments, but you don't actually get, okay, what what is this? And you know, steeped in history in that in the Christian tra tradition, you know, talking about service and all of that, I think it makes a lot more sense. Um, but you know, we don't have coronations very often, so we've got to keep going back and over also, it. So we're probably not going to have a really big royal jamboree event like this for quite a, a long yeah. time now. There will be, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, like a period of um, stability. But I think it is important to, to note that obviously everybody isn't mad keen on the, on the monarchy and I think these arrests yeah, let's have cast a bit that. of a stain over things. Let's talk about that, shall we? Um, I was quite struck by Lucy Fraser saying she thought the police had got the balance right uh, at the minute between allowing people to enjoy the coronation and not be disturbed but also making sure people could protest and there have been some difficult headlines. Do you, what, what's your take on this, Salma? So, look... Everybody, we are live in a free country, monarchy or not, and everybody has the right to protest, but we have rules that govern protests in order to make it safe for everyone. I can't sort of predict what the policemen on the ground were thinking about, but we have to take into account that they are on the ground, they're understanding the situation, they have protocols and they have policies around this. Now, if that needs to be challenged in some way, there will have to be a proper investigation. But on the face of it... You know, there are strict rules around this. The police are very mindful of what they need to do, especially in a situation like this with huge crowds that they have to keep secure and safe. And so I haven't seen anything that suggests to me that it was improper. What, what, what do you think? Well, I do take the point that the, the police have got, you know, a really, really tough job to, to do, particularly when, on an event of, of this sort of scale with this kind of crowd control. But 
I just want to see the information that comes forward about whether they did go in quite in quite a heavy-handed way. And I think what will be interesting as well is whether they felt the sort of overbearing political pressure, because we know this week there's been a lot of focus on really cracking down on protests, along with a lot of criticism of the police and the Metropolitan Police. So I just hope that they they didn't act in a way which was completely disproportionate. Because, look, we've talked about what it means to be British through the, through the monarchy and all the pageantry and everything, but, but protest and, and having, like, a diverse set of views and freedom of speech is also really important to, to the DNA of, of this country. So we don't want to have a situation where any sort of dissent, we see a kind of Russia-style, Chinese-style crackdown on everybody. There's got to be the, the right balance. And I think we'll have to really wait for the facts to come out to see if that, that was the case. In the statement that the Met Police put out, they said that they need to take into consideration the context of the event. So do you think there's like a lower threshold, or if, it's, if there is, is that right, for this kind of policing? Look, there's, there's two things that you have to be really mindful of in, in these situations. And, I, you know, when I was in government, we looked at big government events and, you know, how you police crowds and things like that. The threat levels that are going to be um, that, are, that, are, that are going to be present, you know, the police are, are cautious and understanding various different threats. Mm -hmm. So there's threats in terms of the crowd control. There's threats in terms of personal security for the people who are around. They have seen these things happen before with loud noises, you know, designed to spook horses and things like that on parade, um, and also, you know, potential of um, attacks within the crowds. So they are looking at a thousand different things at any given point. So I, I. I often think that we we over um, we are overcritical sometimes of a very very hard job. Any coronation plans later today or street party? Obviously, what street party? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sadly working. I'm presenting. <laughs> the <laughs> show. But then I'm going to have a bit of a rest. Also, because so when I was watching it, I didn't. You know, there was so much going on. It was quite hard to see. I think I'm going to go and rewatch some of it. Also, oh, Sam and I were having that's a great proper old, fan. That is, but we were having a great old chat about the outfits. So I might go back and have a little spin. Yeah. I, we don't think it was the best dressed. No, we're we supposed think, to say that on air. <laughs> I think people sort of let the side down a bit, apart from Penny Morden. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> to say that dress was flawless it really was um thank you both very much uh, indeed i'll let you go to the work in the street <laughs> <laughs> that's it for this week's at safer ridge on sunday in a moment though we are going to be running through today's interviews and those local election results too with our deputy political editor sam coates thanks for joining us this sunday morning
welcome back. This is Sophie Ridge on Sunday The Take, a chance to look back at our interviews this morning on the programme and try and work out what we learned and in particular, of course, the views on last week's local election results. Now, it was one of these programmes where you think, um, do we just need to ditch the whole thing? Do we need to do it from uh, the coronation itself or should we be doing it from Westminster? And in the end, we went for the third option. Loads of coronation news on the show, of course, uh, in particular as well, the policing of some of those protests too. So a big focus in our interviews. But of course, those local election results did really feel like a moment in British politics. Um, although there is a question about the size of the win, is it going to be a majority? Is it going to be a minority? If these results replicated in a general election, it would be Keir Starmer in number 10, a Labour government uh, for the first time in a very long time. Well, with that in mind, I can bring in Sam Coates, uh, Deputy Political Editor. Uh, lovely to have you here in person, Sam. It's a pleasure. We know it's a big weekend when that happens. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the local election results. Um, we were there, weren't we, on uh, Friday, and it really did feel as if it's quite a moment in British politics. That's right. I mean, one of the weird things that the coronation has done is sort of stop the discussion about local elections. Now, maybe it's a minority of people who, who, who focus on that, but it is the whole of the Westminster village, the whole of the British political system does stop and take stock after something as momentous as that. But instead, we had, you know, man on chair gets hat uh, is a way of slightly, you know, full stopping that conversation. So we're going to try and revive that this morning because it was such a big moment. Um, as you say, you can have that discussion about quite how le well Labour did and what side of the kind of majority line that these results would imply. But there is not going to be a Conservative in number 10 after the general election if there's anything like these kinds of results. And that's a big deal, right? Because, yeah, you could say, we knew that already, look at the polls. But this is the first time Rishi Sunak has been tested at the ballot paper. And there has been a bit of talk in Westminster, hasn't there, about is the lead softening? Is Rishi Sunak managing to cut through? And I have to say, this was a bit of a wake-up call. It was a bit. And, you know, there, there has been a bit of a narrative in the last couple of months based on polls, based on kind of appearances that Rishi Sunak were, had upped the Conservatives' game, that he had uh, slimmed down and honed a message, that he'd had a couple of wins when it comes to the Windsor framework, and that things were going better and British politics was um, more competitive again. And so what's important about Thursday is that it shows that conservative expectations were too high. They were wrong. They were over-optimistic. They thought they were too pleased with themselves. They thought they were going to do better, and they didn't. And that is a shock. You know, I've got conservative MPs going, I'm depressed mm. at, the, at the result because I know I'm out of a seat if it's anything like that, which is why the reaction of the conservatives and the Labour Party is really important. Mm. But the big question, the big, the big kind of personal group to focus on is Rishi Sunak and the government. Yeah. Do they take this, as Jackie Joel Price said to you, Labour MP said to you, as a wake-up call to stop mm. bickering and simplify their message? Or, as we sort of heard on Friday morning when I met Rishi, uh, when you interviewed Shadow Cabinet members, and then this morning from Lucy Fraser, it's a bit more head down, carry on as we were. Yeah, I thought I felt that with the government interview as well, which we'll hear uh, from uh, in a moment. But let's just, I just want to play West Streeting first because we decided to start with our Labour guest, which is unusual uh, for us uh, on the programme, but perhaps some reflection uh, of those results. And I asked him whether a coalition with the Lib Dems could be the direction they're heading in. Just listen to what he had to say. I just don't think that is the scenario that we're going to be in after the next general election. But if it is, which is very but, possible looking at these results... I honestly think Keir Starmer could literally be on the way to the palace in the car, having just been um, summoned to be Prime Minister of a majority party, and the Conservative Party and some parts of the media's talking points would still be, oh, it's a difficult night for the Conservatives, what, but Labour no, could have done better, I tell you come what, on. I, I'll give you my word that if that is a scenario <laughs> that happens, I will not be asking these questions. However, in these scenarios where the results point towards a hung parliament, it is a legitimate question to answer. No, I, no, I think we're, this, is a, this is a process, not an event. We're not at the final destination yet. Take Hull, where, uh, I say through gritted teeth, the Liberal Democrats did rather well. I heard the Lib Dem leader of Hull Council the other night saying, well, look, locally people have voted Lib Dem, but at the general election, people in this city vote Labour. You asked the wrong question of West Streeting. How could you? <laughs> I know, I got in trouble there, didn't I, uh, from West Streeting? He wasn't happy with that one. Um, but it is a legitimate question, right? Of course it is. And, and it's, not, it's not a surprise that West Treating sort of wants to scare us all off 
funnily enough, it doesn't work, um, from, from having this discussion. And, 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 and there's a bit of historical context, recent history, uh, historical context to that, which is in the 2015 general election campaign, the Conservatives, who, you know, were also at points in that parliament facing a resurgent Labour Party, stumbled across an incredibly effective tactic. In the wake of that Scottish referendum that, where Scotland uh, voted narrowly to remain part of the United Kingdom, they realised that the election results pointed to the possibility of a hung parliament. And so what they did was they said, well, look, if there's a hung parliament, Labour are the largest party, then you're going to have Alex Salmond, the uh, SNP leader, and uh, Nicola Sturgeon pulling the strings of Ed Miliband, making demands in order to get through budgets, legislation, and even possibly to determine who is in number 10. And that was incredibly effective. It really worked well. And it's a tactic that the Tories have been sort of keeping their eye on ever since. It was interesting, though, because... We were there when the um, House of Commons projection uh, came in and I just remember you, the first thing you did when you looked at the numbers is you said, well, that would be a coalition with the Lib Dems, not the SNP. Mm. And you were saying that that was significant. And do you think it's, I guess, less of an issue for Labour to be linked with the Lib Dems than it would be the SNP? So, undoubtedly, uh, the projection is good for Labour, uh, even if they fall short, they might not have to turn to a nationalist party who quite clearly, whose values they oppose, they tell me, they tell viewers, uh, they really reject uh, nationalism, separatism, uh, the SNP drive to break up the United Kingdom. And so they could never talk to them in any scenario because there's coalitions, but there's also minority agreements, you know, you know, legislation by legislation, discussions. There's all sorts of ways of managing a hung parliament. And it's much easier if you've got somebody, uh, another party that was campaigning to oust the Tories that broadly speaking, is progressive. Yes, it has some policy differences, uh, but, but by and large, they're probably slightly closer bedfellows, if, 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 if not completely overlapping. But I think it's something else. It's not just the question of who the bedfellow is. The question is whether or not, by rolling out this tactic, the Conservatives can try and make Kistama look weak. There's a, there's a sort of thing in British politics that isn't in German politics or... Uh, uh, or, or other um, political systems, which is that we fetishise our leaders looking decisive, kind of the, the guy at the top or the woman at the top taking unilateral decisions and everyone has to bend to their will and discussing coalitions, agreements with other political forces is generally seen oddly uh, in public as a bit of a sort of dirty concept because maybe it implies weakness of the person at the top. It's completely normal in lots of other places in all over Europe and... Uh, uh, and in Brussels, uh, but in Britain it's seen as weakness. And, and I think that, yes, there's the question of who the coalition or the minority partner is, if, if necessary, or whether it's a point-by-point a, 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 a point deal, but also it's this... It, they, they're trying to, the Tories will be trying to plant the idea that Keir Starmer might have to do deals and that's weak, and, and that's the message that they're trying to get in people's brains. It's worth hearing from the Labour Party about their retort to that, not only do they rule out any discussions with the SNP at all, indeed, West Street ruled out any discussions with anybody, but they make the point that Rishi Sunak is in a coalition himself with his own party, with all these different factions, and indeed these different factions have steered the Conservative governments of the last 13 years in directions that the Prime Minister would rather not have taken, take the Brexit referendum, David Cameron wouldn't, of his own, own volition, have ever gone near that in hugely divergent ways. Labour go, well, look at them. Just because it's, they've all got conservative badges doesn't mean that they're not, that the Tory, successive Tory leaders aren't bullied by their own party. Um, that's not going to happen to us. So it's a big yeah. argument, and it's a big argument that we're going to be having in the weeks and months to come. Yeah, you can certainly see that. And uh, one that I think Labour are going to get frustrated about, as you saw in that interview uh, as well, <laughs> that's certainly uh, perhaps not going to go away. But look, as me and Sam were saying, extraordinary night for Labour. And really, the big story is it's so difficult now to see that landing zone for the Conservative Party ahead of the next election, which leads to the question, what are they going to do? And I'm sure we're going to get all sorts of voices coming out uh, with all sorts of ideas about the direction that it needs to go in. Already we've had uh, this morning, uh, for example, John Redwood, Keeler's trust backer, saying that the Conservatives need to cut taxes. And on the programme today, I spoke to the Conservative MP, Jackie Dole price about the local election results. This is what she thinks the Conservatives need to do. What the election results show on Thursday is that that's not quite cutting through and perhaps there is a case for rebooting that message. But but that's what happens after elections. You, you take stock about the message that you've been given and, and you act accordingly. 
But I think it's more about reassuring people that, you know, we are not going to carry on borrowing and spending in the way that we have. And we are going to refocus and be a good conservative government that delivers economic competence, that doesn't overpromise and that allows people to keep more of what they own. I mean, look, she's trying to be, not to show that she's putting the boot in too much, but the thing that came out of that for me is she's calling for lower taxes, right? Yeah, I, I thought it was very human, very it was. Good, good interview. I, you, you enjoy listening to Jackie Doyle Price. Stop bickering, she told the party a little bit earlier in that interview. Um, but yes, there was a call um, for lower taxes, but I thought in many ways um, what you just heard encapsulates the Conservative um, problem because she said that, first of all, we need to change the message. Then she said uh, we need to be a more conservative government, so we've got to borrow less, spend less. And then she said, but we've got to spend more because we, we need to deliver tax cuts, which, of course, involves spending money. And the bottom line, Sophie, is we're at that point in the political cycle where, bluntly, you can't do big reform because there isn't time and, you know, you don't anything that's big reform upsets people. And you don't have that much cash left. You know, there's not much money left. And what, so all they can do is throw cash at the electorate and promise to throw cash at the electorate in the form of tax cuts this side and the other side of a general election. So, yeah, that's what Tory MPs are going to ask for. Yeah, it's probably what they're going to get in the autumn statement. In all likelihood, Jeremy Hunt will announce, uh, the Chancellor will announce um, uh, a sort of targeted tax cuts in the lead up to the election as a, as a sort of sweetener. Um, but that's the. Look, as, as Dominic Cummings always said, Downing Street's only lever when they're in a hole is to splash the cash and to, and to cut taxes. And, and there is, there aren't, they don't have any other levers that they can pull. It does feel like an incredible bind. Um, they either take a risk, which they need to if they look at the polls, but then do they undo their reputation for economic competence? And then if you are making reforms, who are you going to try and appeal to? The red wall voters who are leaking to Labour or the blue wall voters who are leaking to the Lib Dems? It really does feel very difficult uh, indeed. Um, now, Sam obviously is very excited about the local election results and wants to talk about the politics, but I am going to force him to talk a little <laughs> bit uh, about the uh, coronation. Uh, in particular, of course, the protesting, because the police have been accused by some of being too quick to arrest protesters at yesterday's coronation, even though they had warned that they'd have a low tolerance over protests. Have a quick listen now to Daisy Cooper and also Lucy Fraser when I ask them about it. I've got concerns that they may not have done. Uh, we still need to see some more information coming out about what's actually happened. Some of that information is unfolding, but on the face of it, I do have concerns. Uh, the fact is that in this country, when it, whether you're a royalist or whether you are a Republican, we should all be able to agree on uh, free speech and the right to protest. There is a distinction between peaceful protest on the one hand and disruptive and um, uh, you know, violent protest on the other. What concerns me is that the Conservative government have introduced very far-ranging uh, sweeping powers for the police, which affects all protests. I think what we may have seen uh, yesterday, but we still don't know, what we may have seen uh, is some of those um, new measures are being used by the police. Uh, no, the, the police are operationally independent uh, from government, but I, what they had to do was to police you know, an international event uh, on the world stage, and I think they took that into account in their policing. And what they have to do is balance the right of people's... Uh, the right to protest, which is important in a democracy, uh, at the same time as the right of all those other people to enjoy what was a fabulous day. And, and I, I don't know the, the instances, the particular instances, but I think uh, overall they managed to get that balance right. Well, it really felt there, didn't it, that there was a bit of a dividing line there between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives when it comes to the protesting and the policing of that, which I guess you'd expect, right? And um, they're both um, parties who would have naturally different positions on it. But it does feel like with these big occasions, the big royal events, there's so much politics in the way that politicians have to respond to it. That's right. There, there's, it's fashionable to say that the monarchy is above politics, and in some sense is that true, but, but really it's not. And, and watching bits of the coverage last night, what really strikes you is that we spend our whole time talking about politicians, perhaps the most temporary bit of, you know, the British state. They come and go, but monarchs endure. And it, it, it is now King Charles's government uh, that we're discussing. It will be for him uh, to receive whoever is the prime minister after the next election. One prominent politician, Penny Mordaunt, played an extraordinarily uh, impressive role carrying the sword uh, as Lord Privy Seal. Uh, she's that won't the... do her leadership chances any harm. Exactly, in, in, a, in an amazing outfit. And um, 
Uh, and I think that it's a reminder that there's more to the British state than what goes on in Downing Street. It did make me realise as well how careful Labour has to be on this, because Keir Starmer has done a lot to show that he is a patriotic politician. And Wes Streeting as well. Are you a bit of a royalist? Yes, yes, I am a royalist. Wes Streeting's the person you put out on mornings like this. There's, mm. there's no danger of a kind of double-edged, nuanced answer from Wes. Not sure about the rest of the Shadow Cabinet. Um, yeah, exactly. You had to be a bit careful about those ones. <laughs> they were looking through the list. Right, Wes Streeting, he, yeah. he can do the interviews this morning. Mm. I can definitely see that. Um, how about you, Sam? Are you a bit of a monarchist? Are you out and about celebrating the coronation? It's a bit of a weird day yesterday because it wasn't a bank holiday. So it's all the usual kids' classes. So missed the coronation, but then caught it all up at nine o'clock. The one hour Sky special, it's still on YouTube. Highly recommend it. I did, uh, I did watch it all with the family. Uh, I've managed to um, get my street parties in for later today, which I feel is actually a great idea because the weather yesterday was quite sadly appalling. Well, it? I'm going camping in the rain, so that's how you celebrate coronation weekend okay. properly, I think. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, that's what you need to recover, I think, perhaps from those uh, local election results. Really busy uh, weekend uh, here in Westminster. Absolutely incredible spectacle uh, of the coronation. Uh, we'll be back to full coverage of that on Sky News after this small pause <laughs> for a bit of political reflection on the local elections. Uh, important, of course, because it really does feel like what happened on Thursday could have repercussions in the years to come. That is it from Sophie Ridge on Sunday, the take uh, this morning. The podcast will follow around uh, lunchtime, so definitely worth checking that out with all the best interviews on the programme uh, to come. We are going to be seeing you again next week. I think we need a bit of a breather, to be honest, uh, after this uh, weekend. So have a wonderful <laughs> bank holiday weekend, and I hope you enjoy the quiches or the Victoria sponges at whatever garden parties you are at. Lots, of course, to come on TV as well. We'll see you next week. Thank you.